Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to a very special VMware Tanzi webinar, securing Kubernetes clusters with VMware Tanzi Mission Control. Today, I'd like to welcome in two amazing gentlemen. We have Corey Dinkins here and Ryan Conley. Hey guys, thank you guys for joining us today. Um, before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items that we'd like to start off with. First, we'd love to keep this as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions for us, please submit them below using the Ask a Questions tab, and we'll do our best to answer all of the questions live. In addition, we know that you guys are here to hear from us, but we'd love to hear from you. So let us know how we did, how we're doing, or what you'd like to hear at future events by hitting the Rate This tab also below the presentation screen. And without further ado, um, let's hand this off to today's speakers. Corey, Ryan, off to you guys. Thanks so much, AJ. So thanks for having us on again to talk about Kubernetes policies. This is something that we're finding is kind of a blind spot for a lot of customers and something we want to make sure is on the forefront of your minds and something that is a, a tool that you can use to start securing your clusters and meeting the different compliance and regulatory compliances that you need to, to meet and secure your networks. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Ryan and he's going to go through some slides and walk us through it. Awesome. Thank you, Gordon and AJ. So we want to kind of level set. Uh, so where we're coming from, as well as where we're going. And part of that is taking a step back. We're going to not look at this from a VMware lens. We're not going to have any blinders. And we're going to look at the larger community. And when I say community, I'm referring to the open source community and, and particularly the body who are consuming Kubernetes and the associated projects. And then we'll think about and, and talk through some of the ways you can kind of leverage some of the benefits that we're learning. and. As we start out, if we look back, the last uh, Kubernetes will be nine this year. We have nine years of survey feedback, and security has always been top three. Uh, usually it's top one. And if we look at the most recent survey uh, that VMware commissioned, um, and we call that the state of the Kubernetes going back from the last year, and we see misconfigurations and exposures are a consistent challenge. And so we'll kind of talk about like, what is a misconfiguration? This could just be wide open uh, settings that could be locked down, so low hanging fruit, uh, as well as challenges with consistently applying policy. So something that should have been applied in prod but didn't make it, something that maybe should have been tightened down, uh, as well as a single set of tools or consolidating the tools. And more often than not, that's just having a single context to do multiple items. Security is, is a large umbrella, it's an onion, if you will. And so we're looking at data protection, we're looking at various layers of security, as well as implementing like encryption. And so one of the ways we're giving you some new tools in your bag is a set of resource hierarchies. And for those like myself, I was a systems admin for 13 years prior to joining VMware. I'm very familiar with hierarchy and active directory groupings. And so this is a way for you to imply policies at different levels. And so you see here at the very highest level, we have an organization, uh, which could be your business or even your larger team. And then we give you two structures for grouping. And grouping allows you to apply individual policies to either uh, apply it once, set it and forget it. And this could be for a group of clusters, which we refer to as cluster groups. Or this could be a group of namespaces, a Kubernetes object, and that we call workspaces. And the important thing to realize here is this is getting you started in your multi-cloud journey or your multi-cluster journey, because workspaces could be a group of namespaces across many Kubernetes clusters, across many clouds. And the same with cluster groups. You've got to have clusters running on Azure AKS, uh, Amazon EKS, Rancher, OpenShift, or even on-prem vSphere with uh, vSphere for Tanzu or Tanzu Kubernetes Grid. Corey? Yep, I think that about covers most of it. Um, you know, I think the one thing I'd like to add to is just keying in on the different use cases for these different grouping constructs. So when we look at cluster groups, for example, this is really a focus that or a view that you would generally expect platform operators or, you know, anyone that's managing clusters would generally uh, interface with. So they'd usually work within the cluster groups, um, configuring uh, continuous delivery settings for those groups, maybe some Helm charts that might get deployed to them, et cetera. Uh, then when we look at the workspace construct, that's really a view that's kind of, it's more dedicated towards your DevOps or your app ops and even developer type personas. 
And this is primarily because, you know, going back to the state of Kubernetes report, we're seeing, you know, companies do not want developers owning clusters. They want them owning code. You know, they want them owning pipelines and things related to code, but not the infrastructure. So this is an important way to be able to kind of disassociate one, you know, the infrastructure side with the, I guess, application runtime side, we would say. And so you can separate out these concerns and then by giving you know, developer access to one workspace, if your application is spread across multiple clouds or multiple data centers, um, or even just multiple clusters, uh, you can now give them access to all the namespaces they need in all of those clusters by just assigning one permission. So I think just being able to use those two different constructs to help kind of separate out operations and streamline how you can provide access to these clusters is a pretty uh, key thing to being able to scale and even, you know, I'd say, modernize applications too. And so if we see this in action, we have a way to kind of regulate who has access to what, as Corey was saying, as well as what access do they have. So we're providing authentication as well as authorization. And this is coming from your top level identity provider. So in many cases, this could be Active Directory or ADFS now. Um, this could be LDAP, et cetera. And so we're providing you a central identity store at the very top. And we'll kind of show you in the demo what that looks like. Once you have that identity source, you can then propagate down to the individual resource objects. So just like we've been doing in vSphere, or just like what we've been doing with Active Directory. And these are applied at the Kubernetes cluster level with native Kubernetes role-based access controls. So this allows a couple things. Um, you're taking an existing identity authority that's already well used and well trusted by your uh, enterprise, and you're able maybe, to apply. Maybe well configured too, <laughs> should we say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm putting trust that it's uh, it's well uh, well configured. And so this allows you to have a team of individuals, for example. So Corey mentioned developers. We might have InfoSec. Um, for example, they may want to have an auditing role. And then you also have the ability to apply different types of policies based on the environment. And so a classic example is you have your non-production site and your production site. And so this is where we could have a stricter set of security controls on production, but maybe a little bit looser on the non-production. Um, but you can do this based role-based access controls via groups or individuals. So as Corey mentioned, the trends in the community are getting away from developers having uh, more and more controls and more and more ownership of the overall Kubernetes, which is just a platform for applications, just like vSphere and Amazon are just platforms. And so that ownership is transferring to platform teams who have a, a long history uh, of running platforms in production. And this could be for compliance. This could be for just the sake of ownership. Uh, developers are, are definitely driving features when they're writing code. They're not driving features when they're managing Kubernetes updates, for example, whereas that's something that we've been doing on the operator side for many decades now. Um, so the idea is to kind of remove some of the low value tasks, remove some of the autom or the repetitive tasks. Let's automate that. Um, and then Corey called out a, a good item here on the slide, which is we can do all, all these things without touching any YAML. So for those who are new to Kubernetes, um, maybe that's a burden they don't want to climb today and they just want to set it once and configure it and be done with it. And that's something we can showcase. I think beyond that too, it's it's even a matter of, of being able to include others in. So if you are constrained, right, you can actually write instructions or run books for other members of the team to be involved. They don't really need to have a heavy lift to say, oh my goodness, I have to learn all of this YAML. Like, you know, this, this is not what I'm trying to do right now because I also need to learn all the other components of this company that I'm supporting, you know. So it, it's a very complex ecosystem and adding in another complex platform is not really helping the situation at all. So, you know, I think this is a point that's often overlooked of like, well, I don't care. We'll just teach everyone YAML. But if you've ever had a team of people and you've tried to train them on complex tasks, you'll know that. You know, it's, it's never a surefire thing that everyone's going to pick it up the same or even at the, the same speed, right? So you kind of have to be prepared to, I don't want to say lower your bar, but I say lower lower the barrier of entry yeah. so that others can help, right? That's really the, the main goal here. 
And if you think back to, I'm a big fan of the Phoenix Project, a book that was written over a decade ago. But a lot of that is how do you reduce your dependency on this on the one person? We've had a lot of customers who had one individual. They got very savvy, very mature in their experience with Kubernetes. Uh, and then maybe they got promoted to a leadership role or maybe they left the company. And then you have a, a team behind them that are, that are trying to pick up the pieces. And so that's why being able to very quickly onboard any clusters in your environment, very quickly apply and secure the configuration uh, is very valuable in my opinion. Yeah, I think another angle a lot of people kind of overlook too is we deal with a lot of companies that do acquisitions of other companies. So they're doing a lot of, we'll just say reintegration of stuff, you know, across uh, forests and domains and all these type of, we'll just say disparate constructs, right? Because you're bringing in a whole different company's processes, infrastructure, and all these these things into your system. Like, how do you... How do you easily and confidently say, okay, well, we've got those brought into our system. Now we've also met the same security that we expect as, as you know, we run our company and you can begin, you know, really, you know, I guess getting those, <laughs> I would say tedious things out of the way, right? You can do it in one real quick motion and it's a pretty significant time saver. Yeah. InfoSec has requirements. We got to meet them. Uh, we also want to stay out of the news. We want to stay out of getting hacked by the latest CV. Um, this is just a constant challenge. I agree. Yep. So moving ahead, we're going to talk about a couple different policies uh, as well as how do you kind of configure your clusters with them. But we do want to kind of call out a, a limitation by some. And that is uh, with all of the modern, I say modern, but the latest bundles that include vSphere. Um, so vSphere Plus, for example, um, that has a public cloud component with the um, cloud consumption interface, as well as includes Tonsu Mission Control Essentials. Um, this is the same for VMware Cloud Foundation Plus, uh, VMware Cloud Packs, and then VMware Cloud and AWS all include a very streamlined version of Tonsu Mission Control Essentials. Uh, whereas today we're going to be talking about the uh, the full what is sold standalone Tonsu Mission Control, as well as included with the Tonsu Kubernetes Operations bundles. Um, so on the right here, we'll be demoing the full suite, uh, but we did want to kind of call out if you're an owner of any of these bundles on the right, uh, you're going to have a streamlined set of features. And so we just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. Yep. And real quick, Ryan, we do have a question from, I think Rami is how you pronounce it. Oh. Um, he's asking, is it using inherited roles from the cloud provider or only controls access on the level of Kubernetes resources? So it's actually both, right? So we are inheriting roles from your, you know, identity provider of choice. Uh, I believe for the TMC or Tanzu Mission Control SaaS version, it's going to need to be a SAML uh, endpoint. But you essentially inherit your groups, your users, you know, from that authentication source, and then you apply RBAC to those, and that RBAC is carried down into the Kubernetes object layer. So you can even do things at like, you can fine tune a custom role for a service account that might have, you know, read only access to a specific set of services and only services. And then you can apply that role to cluster groups. You can apply it to individual clusters, but you can really, you know, fine tune all those different roles and permissions uh, to meet your security needs. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, OAuth 2, SAML, um, most commonly, you know, you just whatever identity provider you're using today. And then for those who have ever leveraged Tons of Mission Control on either a trial or maybe they just purchased and they activated, you can also just get started with email accounts, but that's obviously not going to scale and, and be enterprise grade. Yep. And I guess we'd also be remiss to, to not mention the fact that, so we just announced the release of the self-managed version of Tanzu Mission Control. And the primary difference is uh, the SaaS version is hosted by VMware. We you know maintain it, we update it, et cetera. So we, we do all that for you. The self-managed version uh, was released so that you can download this software and deploy it in your own uh, networks and environments. And so if you've got an internet you know, restricted or disconnected slash air-gapped environment, you can now deploy the self-managed version in that air-gapped environment to help you with cluster management. So um, something that a lot of companies have been asking us for and 
we're glad that it's finally available. So definitely yeah, check it out. Particularly for customers who operate in Amazon GovCloud, for example, yep. uh, or for those who are true air gap, don't have any connectivity, um, whether it be sovereign cloud, federal government, uh, et cetera, this is definitely big. Uh, off the top of my head, you're going to need three things. You need uh, a Kubernetes cluster that's remotely uh, current. You need an OIDC provider, just like we were talking about with that identity authentication, and you'll need an OCI compliant registry. Uh, those are kind of the three baselines. And then if you're going to be doing data protection, you're going to need an S3 object store. So those will be the four things. The big thing I'll call out, though, is you do not have VMware site reliability engineers behind the scenes for you. This is on you to install. This is on you to update. Um, so I just want to level set expectations. The, the one thing that uh, I probably didn't clarify earlier is there's two versions of Tonsu Mission Control today um, that, that are being, one is being sold all the cart, which is Tonsu Mission Control Advanced. That's the fully featured that we'll be doing today. And then there's the entitlement that comes with uh, the bundles on the right. For customers who had previously purchased Tonsu Standard, um, they do have a different entitlement, but that is essentially based on customer feedback, they wanted advanced. So now we just have a single version that we sell, which I'm personally a big fan of. So getting started with policies, um, this is an onion, just like security uh, is many layers. And so we're going to do a side by side, what policies are included with native Kubernetes, as well as what policies are included with projects within the Kubernetes community, such as open policy agent. And so uh, a question will kind of raise for the audience, you can throw in chat, who here is doing policies in Kubernetes and, and how are you doing them? So from a native Kubernetes policy standpoint, um, really the low hanging fruit where everyone gets started is access. Uh, and so the question we'll raise to the audience is, you know, how are you managing and granting access to your Kubernetes clusters today? Um, how are you kind of managing service accounts, for example? So if you have a Jenkins or an Argo C CI, I'm sorry, Argo CD for your CI CD, or maybe you have security services uh, that InfoSec needs to have auto access. How are you kind of managing that today? Yeah, I mean, we've we've heard from multiple customers at trade shows. You know, we've we've talked to different ones that are you know looking at TMC or Tanzu Mission Control, and one of the themes that we've heard fairly frequently, but not not every time, is that you know a lot of customers manage clusters individually. So they have a cube config, they switch their context every time they need to update something, they apply YAML, and then they move on. Um, which is well and good until you forget to maybe apply it to like one cluster. You know, you've got a list of 10 and you just happen to miss number nine and skip to 10. I've done it before on server maintenance. So, you know, it, it, it's an easy thing to do when you're just trying to get something done. So, you know, we hear a lot of customers still do it manually. Um, you know, it's just really not a great way to scale at the end of the day. So having, clusters in different clouds and different environments means you have to context switch even more. So it becomes a very, a very tedious process just to update one role binding once you start to get past five, even 10 clusters. So yeah, an example I can reference here in the San Francisco Bay Area is there's a customer with over 10,000 Kubernetes clusters. And you can kind of think like, how do I just visualize who has access to what? Just from an audit compliance standpoint, not to mention, are they patched for the latest CV? Are they configured the same? So having a method to just automate and just simplify your lives going forward is, is my top recommendation. Then you get into use cases. And so if we go back to the example of production versus non-production, um, production should be locked down. There's going to be some things that you that the average person should have access to and whatever access is changed should go through a pipeline. So it's validated before going to production. And so a specific example is you have a developer and they want to test a Kubernetes operator, but that's a cluster wide decision. So any changes they're making is now impacting every namespace. And so maybe for non-production, you give developers cluster admin rights or a particular team lead cluster admin rights to build and test a Kubernetes operator, either that they're writing themselves or that they're consuming uh, from a project or a community. But from a production standpoint, a developer should not be making cluster-wide decisions. 
Uh, and so that's where you would limit that to the platform operator role. You could still give individuals namespace admin uh, so they can make changes within, but they're not going to make a, a cluster-wide decision in prod. Often overlooked uh, detail, the, the difference between cluster-wide decisions and well, you know, I'm just deploying this one package to my namespace. Well, you're deploying a cluster-wide package to your namespace, right? <laughs> so, yeah, important and we distinction. Don't wanna, we don't want to stifle innovation. So that's why we're maybe with non-prod, you release um, a little bit of controls and give them a little bit more freedom. But in production, let's make sure we're uh, you know, keeping everything consistent. So the next up is network. And so, uh, again, we're, we're, we're probing the audience, audience here. How do you enforce data? sovereignty or block unauthorized network access within clusters or, or outside of clusters. That's Classic example want. is, you know, how do I make sure that my web front end only talks to my, you know, database back end, right? And how do I make sure the database back end isn't really communicating elsewhere? Because if it is, then we likely have a problem, right? Yeah. So how do we how do we protect those things, right? And how do we ensure that traffic you know, doesn't leave a certain subnet, for example, right? So if you've got your your data sovereignty boundaries set up in IP space, right? It's kind of linked up to your IP schema. This is one way that you can for sure say, okay, anytime, you know, we have workloads running on this cluster, it cannot communicate with these other clusters outside of this, you know, geofence sovereignty domain because we have this policy and we know that this is how it's structured. So it's an important thing to be able to layer on if you're really concerned about these different uh, types of separations. Yeah. And for all of us that are coming from, you know, the three tiered app world, this is directly applicable. And particularly for anyone who is either in California, Canada, European Union, uh, data sovereignty is, is a very real challenge, particularly as it relates to compliance, as well as ultimately performance. You know, we want the customers to have the best experience, whether they're internal customers or even external customer facing. So next up is a, is a very common challenge, particularly for those adopting Kubernetes. Uh, you have a development workload, you have a production workload, that non-prod prod example. Uh, how do you protect the resources for production workloads uh, from a spike in your non-production workloads? And that's something I've seen several customers stumble with. And uh, you know, the chat's open, please. Uh, I'll, I'll offer a, a Starbucks or a, a coffee of your choice at, at Explore for the first person who chimes in. We'll see if there's any takers. Yeah, I think an important one too about quota is, is not even just the prod, non-prod separation. So we have a lot of companies that will build, I don't wanna say massive clusters, but they'll build a large shared cluster for development, right? And so back to Ryan's scenario of, you don't want developer A affecting what developer B through Z is doing because now you just lost a lot of development time and money, right? So you can enforce restrictions and, you know, quotas on namespaces so that you don't have noisy neighbor issues. And again, dev A doesn't just bring all the other namespaces to its knees because, you know, he tried to do something a little silly, right? So I, I think it's important to point out this is more just for more than just you know prod versus non-prod, but also for shared clusters, um, yep. even multi-tenant type situations too, right? Where you may have a multi-tenant cluster that's literally shared by a couple of different disparate environments because of you know how your company is set up, but they're all in the same resource pool, and you need to ensure that one is not affecting the other. Um, so yeah, definitely something that should be thought about and planned yeah, really. <laughs> I agree. Shared services is a, is a great example. Uh, there's a community standard that's been evolving over the last four or five years, particularly, um, you know, the target failure scenario comes to mind. They wrote an excellent medium blog on like lessons learned postmortem. Uh, there's now a website for those who are unfamiliar, I'll throw it in chat, but it's just K8S.AF and it's just Kubernetes failure stories. And the point of that is, the community has chosen a standard, which is mini Kubernetes clusters size to fit the workloads. And that's something that emerged after Kubernetes got easier to install. You know, nine years ago, it took two weeks and then it took three days. And now we're at this realm where in a couple of minutes, you can have a cluster running, particularly if you're automating it with GitOps. And so that leads to new challenges that uh, we should get into cluster sprawl. 
But as it relates to quota, when you have a shared cluster, uh, that is, it could be doing multiple services. You know, I've seen something as large as 4,000 different namespaces supporting 4,000 different microservices on a single cluster. That's a very large blast radius. And that's what the target scenario talks about. So you could have a cascading failure unless you're implementing quota policies. Uh, you're still large blast radius, but quota policies are a very easy way to protect, particularly on resource constrained environments that are, that are on-prem, for example. And we have another question from Rami here asking if we can assign quotas to namespaces, and we can. Yes. Good question. Thanks. Yep, thank you. So that, and and to be clear, right, this has to be a namespace managed by Tanzu Mission Control. So either created by it or uh, you can go into the UI and I can I can show you in the demo how we can manage a namespace. And, and one more point before we go on here to this next column, whoops, it's all right. I was just gonna say, so looking at the two differences, like why we wanted to split these up and, and illustrate these in two different columns. So the policies on the left are all native to Kubernetes. They're, they're built in. We just provide an easy to use way uh, to access and create these policies. That's, you know, as you saw, well, you will see no YAML. Like you do not have to, unless you're doing some really I would say complex things, right? So these will be all native policies that we, you know, provide a, a convenient GUI and CLI to, you know, create these with. And then the next ones that we're going to show you, the OPA policies, they're in addition to what's built into Kubernetes. So these are kind of a bolt on and, you know, one of the, I would say, one of the choices that co the community has picked as the, you know, default standard to secure Kubernetes, so. Just wanted to make sure we pointed that out. Yeah, Open Policy Agent is under the Gatekeeper project. This is an open source project under the Cloud Native Compute Foundation that VMware is contributing to. Um, for those who aren't aware, like the fun part about Tanzu is every solution under the larger Tanzu portfolio of you know 38 plus solutions is every one of them has at least one upstream project. And OPA or Open Policy Agent is one of the projects that is leveraged inside of Tanzu Mission Control. Yep. And so. The first example is security, uh, where we're building off of you know, some of the native security layers in uh, Kubernetes. And so the question for the audience, you know, again, uh, we're looking for that first coffee. If not, Rami's going to get a, a coffee from me at VMware Explorer. But how are you simplifying and standardizing your cluster posture? And when we say posture, we're talking about the standard computer configuration. Uh, most of my customers are, are aiming for a long-term goal of deploy and destroy, meaning Every cluster that gets provisioned is, is configured in an identical way. They can repeat the configuration. And so that starts with your cluster posture. So not just like sizing, but also the configuration of the underlying components. And so there's ways that we can make sure that uh, standardized security posture is just out of the gate. So blocking root level access, blocking privileged container access, limiting network connectivity, limiting file mounts, mounts uh, and more. And I would say, you know, Kubernetes Joe manually applying YAML manifest to every cluster individually is not a, <laughs> that's not a default posture, right? That is um, just inviting mistakes. And, you know, I guess a classic phrase, you know, recipe for disaster, right? So that treating it in that way is, I don't want to say akin to security through obscurity, but <laughs> it is if you miss a cluster, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. that's that's the bottom line, so... And the way I try and approach it is, what does every cluster need when it gets provisioned? Whether it's going to dev, staging, UAT, production, you know, at an edge site, at a public cloud, it doesn't matter. Like, what does every cluster need? And security is a, is a big ball of wax. So this could be logging. This could be, you know, if you think about your larger observability strategy, you have logging, you have monitoring, you have metrics, distributed tracing, um, all that has to be you know, timestamp bound. Um, but just thinking about the larger picture, uh, DR, in my opinion, also falls under security. So how do you layer all the configuration details? Yeah, and back to the state of Kubernetes slide at the beginning, right? This is this one security question is of top concern of most of our survey respondents, right? So seems like kind of an easy problem to solve until you actually get into like the Kubernetes ecosystem and realize like, 
what it takes to roll your own solution and kind of manage this yourself. So, yeah. And the next one is still in line with security, but it's it's specific. So if we look at the images that are deployed into your clusters, there's a number of policies we can layer on. And the low-hanging fruit is production workload should only come from an enterprise image registry, one that is storing your IP, it's implementing your security scanners of choice, um, where you can layer on policies to make sure a critical CVE or a crypto miner is not being deployed. Um, and I jokingly say, you know, how are you protecting your production environments from the winds of CV land and the internet? And um, there's a recent article uh, re referencing just the amount of malicious code that lives on Docker Hub to Gay. This is not a, a finger at Docker because um, that is an open and free resource that they provided. But the challenge with that is most images that are hosted on that site are over 12 months old. And there's a new CV every week. There's also a ton of content that has maliciously been updated. So there's crypto miners, um, various uh, forms of just malicious code that is injected to help a hacker get into your environment. So how are you protecting what goes in your production? And so this is another example of production should be locked down, uh, should go through your standard enterprise grade security controls before it gets pushed out. But maybe in dev, you have a little bit more lax. And so maybe there's a couple of registries that you're opened up. Um, or maybe you have a carved out sandbox just for pulling stuff. But ultimately, like where are you, it's five o'clock, what's in your software, or where is it coming from? And you know, this kind of goes back to the quota thing, right? So if you are in a position where like, well, we have to pull it from this certain registry, well, you should definitely have things like quotas in place because if you do download a crypto miner, right, this is a tool that you use to help limit the effect of that crypto miner on your platform. So yeah, good point. Should somebody accidentally deploy that and you're like, why, why is this namespace just exploding with resource consumption, right? Like, you know, th this is one of the ways that you, it's also an early warning sign, right? So th these are the things that I would look for classically as an admin of like, why is this workspace so elevated in like CPU load, right? This, this is not what I would expect. So important things to, to really think about and take into account. And then for the next one, mutating. Um, and so in this example, you could have a piece of software that's maybe shipped to you by a vendor, have a customer that gets uh, a set of applications from their vendor, and there's a misconfiguration in the manifest. It's missing a property. And so what we had to do is we had to create a mutating policy that would essentially do an initial run, uh, fix the manifest, and then going forward, all the applications would run fine. But just, you know vendor messed up, we're waiting on them to patch it. But in the meantime, uh, every cluster that gets deployed, we make sure this is covered. And to be fair, we've had this issue with our some of our packages even. You know, as okay. we've moved on to um, pod security standards instead of pod security policies, we've had to update our packages and make sure the correct annotations and stuff are there. And there were times when we had to even create some uh, policies for that. And to expand a little bit more on like what mutating policies do, uh, they they take a, a, manif a workload manifest and they actually mutate what's in that manifest and inject your desired value so that it, it is present in there. So if someone's provided a different value than you want, if someone has not provided the value, right, you can then make sure that whatever the value is that you want it to be is set as soon as that hits you know the actual runtime. So. You can do that with the security uh, policies. So defining things like run as user, um, run as group, FS group. We'll, we'll go through the list in the demo. Um, but you can also do this with labels and annotations. So uh, recently released was the ability to say, I want to force a specific label or annotation onto this cluster group or onto this cluster every time any workloads in, you know added here because we want to know these certain you know, values that we need to know. So um, a pretty convenient way to start, you know, automating things in such a way where you're doing, you know, less back and forth tickets on, hey, you need to go fix the manifest and add these things, right? Well, maybe you don't even need that first step because you just define what you want. And as workloads are submitted, you know, they have the appropriate settings for you. So that's how I think about that. And then lastly uh, is custom. And so the beauty of the Open Policy Agent project is the sky's the limit. Um, it has its own programming language. So for those who want to dive in deeper, 
Um, there's a lot of power at your fingertips, but for those who just want to get started, uh, an easy example is just forcing all traffic inbound uh, to be HTTPS. And so you're just adding a layer of security, very low hanging fruit. I've also seen examples of customers who wrote a, a very short and easy um, rule for new developers who are learning Kubernetes. For those who have been systems admins for many years, uh, you're very aware of the single point of failure uh, faults in running uh, an application or even an environment. So another example is they made a, a custom rule that required workloads to be a minimum replica of two. Seems um, innocuous, right? <laughs> Until you run into the problem, you're like, well, why isn't our, why, why is nothing working? Like, oh, well. A replica count, replica count is not correct, and it failed on you know <laughs> the, so. the one node. So yep, yeah. Not and so good. open policy agent layers on new controls, uh, additional policies on top of Kubernetes native policies, and then from a mission control standpoint, we're bringing you the best of both. And so we're allowing you, as Corey said, to very quickly layer on these controls, to implement policies that fit the needs of your applications, and ultimately help secure your business. Yeah, and you know. I'd say technically speaking, the only the only policy on the screen that really requires you to do any kind of YAML diving and crafting is the custom. The rest is really if if you understand like the settings that you need to change, you can interact with them without having to know YAML. And you know, that's one thing that people I think are really hung up on when it comes to Kubernetes is like, well, I don't want to start because I need to know all this YAML. Like, well, you do in in many cases, but not this one. So I think that's very convenient. Yeah. And that's why we have GitHub. We have Stack Overflow. Um, a lot of these could be you know, copy and paste, test, validate. So you're not necessarily having to start writing YAML from scratch either, even when you want to start playing around with custom calls. Yep. All right. Well, with that, uh, we're, we're almost wrapped with slides. We'll have a closing. But from here on out, uh, we'll kind of focus on the demo. Corey, you want to do it first? You want me to? Um, I can. Okay. Let me share my screen. Okay. So, looking at the the Tanzu Mission Control UI, uh, first thing I want to point out is. We just released functionality so that you can create, update, and delete Azure AKS clusters. So Azure AKS, Amazon EKS, and Tanzu Kubernetes Grid are all cluster types that you can create, update, and manage with Tanzu Mission Control. So I wanted to point that out because this kind of leads into the other topics that we're talking about here where, you know, how do you secure a cluster in Azure AKS? a cluster in Amazon EKS and say Google Cloud all the same, right? How do we make sure that they've got the same access permissions um, or even different ones, right? Um, depending on your needs, you may need to separate those permissions. So now do you have to remember, like if you didn't have this kind of tool, right, you'd have to keep a couple of YAMLs and remember which ones apply to which and, and that type of thing. Assuming you have no other uh, continuous delivery type stuff in place, right? Yeah, and the majority of our customers are operating in at least two public clouds, uh, in addition to their on-prem workloads. So on-prem, there's a variety of different Kubernetes distributions, Rancher, OpenShift, uh, Tanzu Kubernetes Grid, all of which are supported with Mission Control. And then in the public cloud, I have customers that are sometimes in as many as six of the hyperscalers. So in addition to the top three, we have Oracle, Alibaba, IBM. Um, so how are you consistently managing your posture? And in, most cases, you have different teams. So you have one team that's all in on Amazon. Uh, you have another team that's all in on Oracle. Uh, maybe they have specific workload requirements that are leading them to Amazon GovCloud, for example. But the rest of production is in Oracle or on-prem. And so the idea is we want to layer on all the security controls with consistent configurations. Yep. So as you can see here, we've got a group. And I just moved this cluster into the group just to, to show everyone kind of what what happens here when you do that. So we have the continuous delivery uh, functionality turned on here. And if we look at the cluster, you can see that we've got a couple packages that have started to deploy. And we'll come back and check on this soon. But 
by adding it into this group, we can deploy a whole set of different packages to this automatically and have it configured automatically for us. So on top of being able to apply policies, we can even automate you know, what's installed on those clusters, maybe how they're configured as well. And so this goes back to some of the common challenges we're seeing in the community surveys, which is misconfigurations. And then in my personal conversation with customers is just trying to get consistency. So going back to the, I'm a big fan of the 80-20 principle. Uh, what does every Kubernetes cluster need, no matter where it's at? You know, the meat on the bone is a little standardize the configurations for logging, observability, security controls, maybe have runtime security, et cetera. And so what Corey's showing is any cluster that gets provisioned or any cluster that gets attached. So maybe you have a GK cluster, for example, or a rancher cluster you can attach. As soon as it's in this cluster group, all of those policy policies and configurations are inherited. Yep. You've set it once at the cl cluster group level and now they're applied automatically. Yep. Let's see here. Let's see this one. Has it made it? So you can see the cluster that we just added, the AKS one. It's still reconciling. Uh, we'll come back and check on that later, but it's going to have you know a full set of applications that we had defined. Um, and then so that's kind of the the applications and packages. We're not going to to go too deep on that because we really want to focus on policies. So kind of switching back into like how do I now grant access to this cluster group, right? And all these different clusters we have in here, they're in different clouds. Um, I would say one caveat to consider here is that just by adding these clusters into Tanzu Mission Control does not automatically configure. Um, so let me take a step back. So if, if you're deploying an Amazon EKS cluster into a private VPC, for example, you're going to need to have connectivity to that private VPC from wherever you, know, you want to interact with it from. So that's just something that um, is good to take note of. So going into the access policies again, um, if we look at the cluster group here that we were just viewing with all those different clusters in it, right? So we have our AKS, GKE, our on-prem vSphere clusters. You can see we've got a couple of different policies that have already been applied. Uh, and in this case, they're inherited from our organization. And what you can see here at the very top is one that's actually automatically added um, you know, it's the it's ability for our IT teams to audit our clusters. So you can see how that how we achieve that internally. And then you can see we've got these other roles here that you can assign to different groupings uh, within our, our cloud org. In our case, these are pretty relaxed. I would, you know, if this was an actual production environment, uh, not my demo environment, I'd probably have this a little bit more tightened down to where most people had, you know, cluster view uh, but only a few people had the ability to actually edit clusters. So, Hey, Corey, if you want to click the hide button on that bright talk. Oh, call, sorry. That's fine. Thank you. Good call. So scrolling down, if we look at direct access policies, right, these are ones that we can apply directly to a cluster group. We can apply them directly to a cluster. And we can scope these to, well, let me just click and show you. So we can scope these to a user, we can scope it to a group, or even a Kubernetes service account, right? So back to my example of we're trying to set up a you know service account for monitoring for this entire cluster group, we can easily do that right from here, right? And then if we look at our different our list of roles here, so these are where you can start seeing all the different roles that apply to this uh, view or this context. And so we can create these custom roles if we wanted to uh, that are very fine tuned to do, you know, essentially what you need them to, right? So if we just look at the roles tab here, we can actually see all these different roles um, and you can see under the type here, which ones are custom. And so what you can do is you can start from one of these uh, predefined ones and you can start fine tuning it for your needs, right? So. You can choose where this role would appear. And then you can go ahead and choose additionally what permissions that they have within Tanzu Mission Control. So we can go through all the 309 permissions, but I don't think that would be a very good use of our time. <laughs> yeah, so if we go back to the access tab there, Corey, I think the, the, the best thing to walk away with is you have a lot of tools in your tool belt. 
you can go to your central identity provider. Uh, you then can, through the hierarchy that we're seeing now, we have two types of uh, organization. We have groups of clusters with cluster groups on the left, and then we have groups of namespaces, uh, which our workspaces are on the right. You go down a level and you can now see how do you want to apply? And these are cascading in how they apply. So you could have a dev team that has a set of dev resources or a group of clusters. And if the developer is in the OU group in Active Directory, for, for example, and that OU group is, is granted direct access, they will have access to all the clusters they can provision. You then can decide what are they authorized to do on, on the left, so that role. And so that goes back to the example we talked about earlier. Maybe in development, uh, as an environment, you give them higher level permissions so that they can deploy Kubernetes operators, as an example, which requires cluster admin, because that is a cluster-wide implementation. But in production, you limit it down. And so developer does not have cluster admin rights, but they have namespace admin rights. And so only the platform team have cluster admin. The key here is you have choice. You have flexibility in how you deploy these different policies. And this supports any Kubernetes cluster as long as it's conformant. So you can add into the to this environment uh, OpenShift clusters if you would like. You can add Rancher clusters. Um, we can provide you a link to the CNCF list of conformant clusters, but it, it's a pretty long one. Um, but any of those can be added to this environment, and you can help standardize them along with every other cluster that you have. So um, again, kind of getting away from manually managing each one and treating them kind of like pets, this is how you can do that. It's a very quick and easy way to get started. Uh, a common challenge is just like, hey, I need visibility in what's going on. Who has access to what? How behind are the, are the updates? Do we have a critical patch, et cetera? Yep. And so again, the, these are the access policies. And just looking at workspaces, you can see we have the same namespace here. But if you look at the pop-up to the left of my mouse, it, they're actually residing on different clusters. So one on AKS, one on EKS and the other two on vSphere. So let's go over to uh, the security or the other policy types and take a look at how you know you can start utilizing these to secure your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, and basically the same methodology as we are showing in the access management, right? You have your organization at the top level, you got your groups, and then your clusters underneath. So looking at a policy, or a cluster group rather. Let's go into the create security policy and just see what this looks like. So off the start, you have the a couple different um, predefined templates that we've created. Uh, one is strict and you know, essentially locks down everything. You know, it prevents root containers, prevents privilege escalation, et cetera. And then we also have the baseline, which is a little bit more relaxed, um, allows a little bit more things. Um, but these are important to understand because this again is where you would start defining, you know, for example, we'd maybe put the baseline template for our developer group, but for all of our production workloads, we'd probably put this on strict and make sure that, you know, all the things that we know are relatively insecure have been locked down and are prevented from happening. Yeah. And this is a really low hanging fruit, easy way to get started uh, configuration. So if we go back to the community survey, misconfigurations and security are our top. At a customer scenario, InfoSec was in the room. They're like, hey, we're blocking privileged containers. Uh, we're blocking root level access. And it was an on-site delivery with Tanzu Labs. And uh, the delivery leads like want to bet. And within 30 seconds, he had done a privilege escalation. Had they applied this security template, that would have been a non-issue. Uh, yep. And so what Corey's showing now is a very just secure by default, still enabling developer innovation, but just let's let's cover our basis. Um, these are all the common ways that malicious actors are exploiting clusters today. So let's just nip it out. And this is done automatically and re repeatably, right? So it just kind of does it for you in the background. Yeah. And then if you go to the bottom there, Corey, uh, the other thing, so we're talking about a production sense, but maybe you want to have more relaxed standards in your developer. Uh, there is an option to have a dry run. So if you have a developer or a team that's getting started in non-production, um, that enforcement action can be relaxed. So they could be a warn or a dry run. So you could have all the same standards in place for production, but instead of explicitly denying, it'll give them a warning and say like, hey, this you can do this here, but this is not going to fly in production. Yep. Yep. And 
we can see this results under insights, but we'll kind of touch on that last after we get through some of these other types here. So quickly kind of going through some of these other types, looks like we're about, we got 10 minutes left here. So I won't spend, I guess, too long on these, but you know, one of the, uh, again, other low hanging fruit and easy, really easy things to do to prevent issues in your environment is put in a policy that blocks latest tag. Um, some people may laugh and some people might go, well, that's kind of silly. Why would you do that? Well, packages update frequently. Um, breaking changes are introduced frequently and that's usually done under the latest. So just like, you know, it's, it's always DNS, you know, it's always, <laughs> it's always the latest tag, right? So this is an easy way to block those things or even restrict where your images come from, yeah. right? So if we say custom, we can, we can dictate our host name, our port, image names, tags, etc. We can even explicitly block certain ones, right? Yeah. So if and you, you can know also uh, like latest, for example, I, I laughed a little bit earlier because there's a bunch of memes that are like, no, 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 and and that's stuff I've seen in uh, you know some like, some customers have in, implemented that into Slack, where if a developer pushes latest, they're like, no, 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 can't use latest. Yep. Nice um, try. The idea is like whatever goes in production should be tested and validated first, ideally through a pipeline. And once it's passed, you have the tag, and then that tag's good to go. Um, but then also, we're going back to just baseline, secure by default, enterprise security. Production workloads should come from a trusted source. That trusted support source should be within your realm, your moat, so to speak. Um, particularly as you have developers who are creating IP for your company, that should be stored on-prem as well. Or I uh, say on-prem, but within a trusted registry. Maybe that's Amazon ECR, Google GCR, it doesn't really matter. Um, but it's coming from a trusted source so that, you know, when it goes into production, you know, it's already been scanned, uh, you know, how it's been built meets the corporate standards and you have that kind of provenance of where did it come from? And then you implement your runtime security at the end. Exactly. And so we're going to, I'm going to quickly breeze through network because this really is essentially akin, you know, to a firewall policy. So if anyone's ever defined uh, firewall policies uh, or network policies in general, uh, you know, this is really just all about configuring where traffic starts and where it's going to end up. You can block it. Um, you can allow certain ranges and exclude them. So it's a pretty uh, standard stuff there. Yeah. And quota is kind of similar in that you really, you know, you have a couple of pre-can choices, but I would expect most people are probably going to go custom and to find their own CPU limits and, and request limits based on you know their actual workload needs. Because if you set your uh, memory requests and limits at the wrong rate without testing, uh, you could very possibly just have your workloads fall over. I've seen it a number of times, so. Yeah, trust but verify. Um, yep. But this is a very easy example. How do you protect your production workloads from the crypto miner example that Corey gave, or maybe from a development workload if it's a resource constrained environment? Um, but Rami, feel free to chime in. How did this answer your question? And it's important to note, uh, we haven't done any YAML yet. Uh, these are all yep. uh, able to be configured via the GUI, CLI, or API. Um, if you want to get your hands dirty in the YAML, you can absolutely do that. And custom policies are a way to get started with that, um, if you so choose, but that's an option. And you can see some of these, uh, anything that has the TMC at the front are the pre, pre-built pre uh, custom policies that we include for you. So uh, some of these are pretty descriptive with a name. Uh, again, requiring ingress, requiring a certain label. Um, you can really, the sky's really the limit if you know how to, to program in the, gate, the OPA gatekeeper policy language, which is Rego. Uh, I think they call it Rego, but... In any case, um, so yeah, the, these are the custom policies, and they're they're quite powerful. Yeah, so we're tr we're trying to provide a set of templates for you to get started if you so choose, and then start to kind of feel out if you do want to start playing around with YAML. Yep, and sorry I didn't spend too long in there. I do want to make sure that I touch on the mutation policies because I think this is going to be more of a default implementation for most as they start you know, implementing Kubernetes um, is how can I make sure these things are done regardless of what someone has put in the YAML, right? I need to just know that 
the things running in this specific environment have these specific properties, right? Like, how do I do that? And this is one way that you're able to achieve that. So, you know, I gave the run as user example before. So we could say, you know, we want all workloads in this specific cluster group to run as this specific user. Whoops. Right. And if we set this to always, anytime a workload is submitted through this cluster group, this property is always appended to that to that workload. So you can do the same with all these other different properties. And then you can even scope it out to a specific namespace by selectors. So if you just want to create these at the org level, uh, you can do that and just scope it to a namespace by labels if you'd like to. And then another common use case is a mutation label, right? So a very common uh, a common use of this is appending, you know, location or maybe data center, things like that. Um, row and rack information if you're running in a data center. So you essentially apply this to a cluster group and any cluster that's added would, you know, receive the appropriate values that you defined here. So I think that's a pretty helpful thing to be able to do and something that I've you know, if I was managing clusters, I would have a lot of mutating policies for, you know, defining out just different environment variables and, and knowing where my clusters and things are running. Well, Corey, let's see if the demo guide smiled upon us and uh, see where that cluster uh, add-on yeah. status is. Good Those call. are the lines with the question. So our friend Rami has, has asked another question around, um, can we create a template for creating new clusters, save this template in a repo, and either deploy via Terraform or just straight out of YAML, which I think is directly applicable to this scenario. I would agree. And was it this cluster? I don't even remember which one it was. I should probably go in the group and look, but it wasn't that one. It was in our dev group here. Uh, but while Corey do, does this, uh, Rami, yeah, the answer is yes. You, you have a lot of flexibility here. Um, Corey was showcasing how you can actually limit the amount of configuration that would be in that template because we're just going to have the cluster group uh, enforce and configure the cluster configurations. And then, yes, there is a Terraform provider if that's your choice. Or you can just do it straight via YAML template, um, which on our docs page, we do kind of give you a baseline for, for configuring various clusters. And then you could add that into your CI CD system. And all this is trying to get customers more towards a journey of deploy and destroy. Uh, so if you're able to very quickly deploy a new cluster, uh, get the app workload online, um, and you have various ways of canary, blue, green, et cetera, um, that gets you out of the upgrade business. Uh, so deploy and destroy is, is the, the end goal. And that's a customer quote that I, uh, I took from a customer last year at Explore that I just love. It's, yeah, it's pretty crucial to being able to actually like rapidly scale. And, you know, I would say have flexibility to deploy workloads like where you need them. Like, I know that seems kind of like generic, but if site A goes down, like I need to know I can successfully move to site B. Yes without any reliance on A whatsoever, right? Because it, it's down, I can't get to it. So like, you know, how do we get back up, right? Yeah, and you said the word backup, but we do have the ability to set up uh, backups with an open source project from VMware called Valero. Um, yep. But ultimately, I want you to be on your journey towards deploy and destroy. If you're having to rely on backups, that means you're having downtime. I want to avoid you from having, having downtime. And so that's yep. where uh, having templates, to Rami's point, being able to leverage GitOps techniques, they quickly be able to deploy new clusters because you're confident in how they're configured. That's getting you more toward an active active and leveraging all the latest benefits of the Kubernetes ecosystem. Yep. And we just enabled CSI snapshot support as well. So if you're running stateful workloads or you know need crash consistent backups of, of different workloads, that's now supported and you can enable that functionality and manage it through Tanzu Mission Control. So also another pretty convenient uh, functionality that I certainly would have been using uh, for databases. Well, Corey, we just showcased seven different types of policies, both native Kubernetes policies, as well as policies within the open policy agent. Um, I know we're getting close to time, so we want to switch back to the, the slides and then we'll kind of close out. Yep. So for those who are in their journey, uh, and we're all on this Kubernetes journey together, uh, to quote my, my peer, Duffy Cooley. Um, VMware has launched a, a full suite of, of education. So we've had Cube Academy, 
um, which has been free online for agnostic Kubernetes learning. That includes uh -huh. projects like Bolero, uh, Cluster API, and more. Um, that's longstanding, uh, cube.academy. Uh, check it out. And then what we've launched this year are two new sites. So for those who are heavily involved in the Spring e ecosystem, in January, we will launch Spring Academy. Again, has free. Um, that's diving into the over 38 projects within the Spring uh, ecosystem itself. And then in March, we launched Tanzu Academy. And so we have a mission control course today. We have a, a, an operator style or a platform operator style learning track. And then coming soon, we'll actually have a new version of the Tanzu mission control education course that'll dive into GitOps and data protection and much more. And then for all of our bloggers out there, um, the VMware community and the VXPert community is very active. Uh, we've launched VMware Tech Zone. Um, and then we now have a new short link to this page, which is acm.vmware.com, standing for apps and cloud management.vmware.com. And this is a way for you to see the latest and greatest. So like just today, as Corey mentioned, we now have um, general availability of lifecycle management of your AKS uh, clusters. Uh, and so you can see here on the left, we have latest content that will traditionally scroll. And then for our bloggers out there, if you write a technical blog, um, we can feature that for you on the right. So that's a set of pinned technical articles that we'll highlight for the greater community. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. And thanks, AJ, for having us on. Hopefully that was informative for everyone. I know Rami said it was helpful, so hopefully it was yeah. for others that were watching. Mm -hmm. And for those who are attending VMware Explore at the end of August, uh, Corey and I will both be there. I will be speaking at the Customer Tech Exchange at Explore, and then Corey will be at the Meet the Experts section, yep, as well as we'll us. both be uh, jumping into booth duty. <laughs> Can't talk about it yet, though. Excellent. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Ryan. Um, all the links that we just talked about these last two slides, as well as the link to Explore and Spring One, are available in the Attachments tab. So you don't have to scramble to type these out or search for them uh, through Google search. The links are available there for you guys. And it'll also be sent out via email in addition to the on-demand um, recording of this presentation. And again, if you happen to be an explorer or would like to meet uh, Corey and Ryan in person, register today. It will be taking place in uh, late August, I believe August 22nd to the 24th in Las yeah, Vegas. Yeah, August 20th to the 24th, yep. Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Corey. Thank you, Ryan. Hope to see you guys here on our webinar program in the future. Um, we had a lot of fun. And thanks to uh, our, our pal Rami for asking all the questions and all the folks that are interacting with the links now and the feedback. So thank you guys and have a great day. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. All.